give your pricing a chance. And part of that is making sure that you're taking a really honest look at what your advantages are an honest look at what your advantages will be in the future and making sure that you're giving those advantages the best chance. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle, now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for in eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts, cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the tight relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Chris Hoff. Here are three things you want to know about Chris before we start. He was our guest on episode 19, where we talked about his pricing metric decision guide, a pretty valuable tool, I thought. He's founder of Pricing Wire, a pricing consultancy that's been around for 13 years now. And he has worked with over 2,000 software and technology companies. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me back, Mark. Good to talk to you. 2,000 companies. That means you can't keep a job? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It really has to do with how I offer my services that opens me up to work with a lot of different companies. Some nice. consultancies tend to focus on large projects because I can help people in smaller ways. That really opens me up to work with a lot more companies. Nice. Okay. So I'm curious. You got me. How do you work with companies? Well, so, for example, there's a number of people that just go to my website, they find me at either they're recommended or they just do a search. And sometimes people just book a strategy session, either 30 minutes, 60 minutes or two hours, and just kind of cover any top of mind challenge or question that they may be facing and want some outside perspective on. Other ways is I do a pricing strategy review. And so that's a more comprehensive effort, but it's really tailored to companies that perhaps are about to launch something or are initially thinking about their monetization approach. And so they just, again, want outside perspective. Another way is a strategy summit. So I've done a number of these, not so much in the last year, but typically go on site and spend one or two days and get the right people on the same page in the same room. And then the other is a more comprehensive, what a lot of people think of sometimes when they think of a pricing consultancy is a, a very comprehensive in-depth effort. So, yeah. yeah, nice, I love that. I, I think doing the, uh, the one hour calls are a lot of fun. I agree. So much value out of it and they're so confused before the call. So I think they're a blast. And I've worked with so many different companies that probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk to and kind of hear their challenges, hear their success, what's worked for them and some really unique companies. It's, it, it really is enjoyable. Nice. So how did you get into pricing in the first place? Well, so I've been involved in pricing by chance, perhaps at every company that I've ever worked for. So initially, we may have talked about this briefly on the first episode that we did together, but I worked at a grocery store that was growing in the Northwest area pretty rapidly. And I had a manager that really was very open to people that showed interest to get involved in the business in greater ways. So not only were they implementing a new software solution, but also I was able to, before I even knew a lot of the terms and the realities around pricing, I was able to test out pricing in the real world in the stores that I worked in. And then from there, every company that I've worked for, I've been involved in pricing in some way, as well as implementing or customizing software solutions to manage sales, marketing, and pricing and bringing those teams together. So, Okay. And so why do you stay in pricing? I just, well, the main reason is because it touches every area of the business. And I just really enjoy the challenges and the realities around how pricing does touch and how companies often don't think about that and they miss opportunities. And so my ability to help companies see things in different ways and then put themselves in a position to really achieve their full potential is very rewarding. So, Yeah, I think, at least for me, very similar, but I think that so few people understand pricing the way we think about it. And yet it's so powerful that it's a blast helping companies get through this. It really is. It really is. And for those that actually get around to allocating their time and attention to it, it can seem somewhat daunting, 
but it can also, they start to see that the opportunities that they likely have been missing out on. And it really kind of, it inspires them in a way that once they get the ball rolling, it's like, why haven't we done this before? We really need to make this a priority going forward. So, yes. Nice. Nice. Okay. You sent me, before we started talking today, you sent me a document called the revenue due diligence, the 10 steps to scalable and recurring revenue. First off, why did you build this? What is it? Well, this has really come out of my work with, again, all the companies that I've either worked at or worked with as a consultant. And it really is to help companies really prioritize their time. One thing that I often say to either a prospect or a client is, even if they got the right people, even if they picked three very key stakeholders in their company and just spent 60 minutes talking about how they would answer these questions, they can be in a much significantly different position to really affect the outcomes that they care about. And one of those primary outcomes when people talk about pricing is really the impact that it has on revenue. So that's why I built this. Yeah. And you know, what's fascinating. We'll go through these 10 and make sure everybody hears them and we'll post this on the show notes as well. But what's really fascinating about it is most of these aren't really about pricing, which I find amazing. I, I'm completely in agreement with you, but I find it amazing. So for example, number one, why would someone pay? What does that have to do with pricing? Well, it has everything to do with pay, <laughs> pricing, yeah. <laughs> and these are worded intentionally. You know, you'll hear the word pay a lot because oftentimes some companies, especially some technology or software startups, they have an innovative technology or solution and they want people to use it. And for some people that are more perhaps on the engineering side of things and building the solution, they don't necessarily allocate much time to how are we going to actually make this a viable, sustainable, growing business. And so the question is somewhat broad in, uh, intentionally, and it's not necessarily asking the question, why would someone pay for what you have to offer, but why would somebody pay for something like what you have to offer, not specifically your company? And again, for any of these, what's really key is it can be a challenge for some people if they're put on the spot to really answer these succinctly and with confidence, that right there should kind of bring to mind that, hey, we really should be able to answer these questions. And really everybody in our company should be on the same page around how we're answering these questions. So. Oh, I dearly love these questions, by the way. I think they're awesome. So I'm going to take why would someone pay and put it in language that maybe my listeners are more used to hearing. And that really is what problem are they trying to solve? And if I were thinking about it, it's the value of solving the problem or what we often call the will I decision. Will I buy something in this product category? And so I think that's just a fabulous question that, that we have to know the answers to. I agree. I, I like how you, you're wording that, but this is, I'll just say that I've intentionally worded it with pay in there because sometimes people think of it in the terms that you described and they don't necessarily take that next step to, but will people actually pay for it? Will they keep paying for it? that type of thing. So yeah, I'm, by the way, I'm not questioning any of your wording. I love your wording. Yeah. Just putting it in language that people might know. Okay. Sounds so good. number two, who is willing to pay? Right. So the next question is, and I have a visual that I didn't send with you. It's, I call it the pricing window. And really, if you think of it on, on the left-hand side, from the bottom to the top, that's ability to pay. And on the long, the bottom from left to right is willingness to pay. So there's a lots of things that we can do that can drive willingness to pay. And you'll look at number three is who is able to pay. Mm. So willingness to pay is different from actually paying. <laughs> and because it's really important, and perhaps when we go to the next one, I'll kind of bring it together. But it, it really is important to understand the different ways you can drive willingness to pay, but also keep in mind around the realities around ability to pay. Yeah. And so it seems like ability to pay is a filter and willingness to pay is, you could think of it as a filter, but it's also something we can influence. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And so if we do jump to number three around ability to pay, around your ability to influence, there are some realities around ability to pay that you really can't influence much around the ability to pay of an organization or an individual. But there are some things that you can do. So for example, one way you can influence ability to pay or possibly drive or increase ability to pay is if you think of your solution, 
and the people within the organization that are impacted the value that is received. Could you possibly make a case for it jumping or extending to other functional areas in the business and therefore justify that they perhaps pool budgets from multiple functional areas and that can actually increase the ability to pay. So those are some of the objections sometimes you hear from a sales standpoint around, you know, we just don't have the budget. Well, there are opportunities if you word it right and you're willing to go there to actually increase the ability to pay. Yep. That makes all the sense in the world. And so is there anything else you wanted to add as far as combining willingness to pay and ability to pay before we move on? Well, if again, if I can send this to you after, but if you visualize that that visual that I just talked about, ability to pay on the left and willingness to pay across the bottom. In many cases, it's very important to understand who your customers are. Again, why would somebody pay? But to draw a line somewhere on that up and down horizontally across for ability to pay and everything below that line are distractions. And so oftentimes companies don't think through these in a very organized and deliberate way, and they can spend a lot of time focusing on being relevant and acquiring customers that really are and should be considered distractions. Maybe distractions for now and maybe not in the future, but it really is important to prioritize your efforts. Yes. So even though we can influence willingness to pay and even ability to pay a little bit, it's so much easier to land customers who have willingness and ability than try to influence that on the other side. That's right. Yeah. So. And there's a lot more we could say about this, but yeah. for the sake of time, perhaps we should go on. <laughs> okay. So number four, when are they most likely to pay? Yeah. So after you've thought through, and again, I suggest having at least a hypothesis around how you'd answer these. And one ways you can think of that is if then, right? So any of these questions, why would somebody pay, right? Why would someone pay? Well, if, fill in the blank, then, right? And the same with who is willing, who is able. And then when you get to when are they most likely to pay, if what happens, what are the triggers, what needs, what are the things that may be unfolding or have led to them possibly, you think about the buyer's mm -hmm. journey, right? And what's really initiated that interest or that willingness to possibly question how they're doing things. And so it's really important to understand what those triggers are. And the better you do that, the better position you're gonna be in to speak to those and be relevant and not miss those opportunities. Yeah, when I first heard that or first read it, in my mind, I'm thinking timing like I'm selling to the education system. And so I've got to close it at certain times because that's when they make all their purchases. But based on your example, your, your description, I could easily see the news talks about a huge data breach at Target. And so suddenly that triggers a whole bunch of people wanting to buy more software security products. That's right. And another is there's for some companies, there's seasonality to how they buy. And this isn't only their initial purchase, right? Their initial decision to do business with you, but when are they most likely to pay to expand with you, right? What are the things that are important to happen to encourage them to renew with you? And, and we'll touch on some of those later. But one example, you know, I heard a conversion stat recently around tax software, you know, like TurboTax, that the conversion rate is around 70%. But also what's important, if you think about it, when are they most likely, when are people most likely to pay for tax software? Well, we're right in that sweet spot right now, as far as the calendar goes. But are they, are they most likely to pay in, say, August? Probably not. There are probably not a lot of conversions going on in August or a number of those months, you know, in the fall and so forth. Right. Makes a ton of sense. Pricing decisions feel risky. How nervous are you knowing you need to raise prices? When, where, and how much should you raise prices so you don't lose customers or lower your rate of new customer acquisition? It's risky enough to make you want to put it off till next year, along with any growth. But pricing doesn't have to be such a mystery. When I work with clients as their go-to resource for pricing advice, I help them better understand the value of their products and how their buyers use price to make purchase decisions. We jointly create strategies they're confident implementing. I can do the same for you. Together, 
you and I apply pricing frameworks to your price increase initiatives or your new product launches or even moving to new pricing models like subscriptions, the best pricing decision you can make right now is to gain access to proven pricing advice. Take some risk out of your pricing. Learn more at impactpricing.com slash advisor. I look forward to working with you. Okay, let's hit number five, and then I'm going to make an observation on the first five. How will they know about you? Yeah, and so once you've answered these other questions, this is a question oftentimes in my work with my clients and just working at companies, just the reality around the marketing effort and making sure that you're in sync from a sales, marketing, pricing, product perspective that everybody's on the same page around understanding how are people actually going to know and how is it best for people to know about the value and the advantages that we deliver to our customers. And so you can quite literally list these out and then prioritize your effort. And I would imagine that's part of what most marketing teams do, but it's really important that this is part of that conversation. And the reality back to the, the title of this being revenue due diligence, it really is going to ultimately impact the revenue performance you're able to accomplish, so. Yeah, so it kind of says marketing is important and are we doing our marketing? Do we know what we're doing? What I'd really like to point out though is these first five, and then I glanced at the last five as well. In fact, all 10 of these, in no case do we say, what price should we charge? Not so far. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And I find that's, that that's... fascinating because you and I were pricing people. Yep. And yet pricing really revolves around everything in the company. And so I, these are just awesome. I love these. Right. It doesn't ask the question, but it helps you answer the question yep. with more confidence and more clarity. And it also gets the organization in sync and on the same page. So number six, why choose you now? Yeah, so this is where it comes into specifically what are your advantages and why would the customer be in a better position to choose to do business with you now versus put it off next week, next month? When this happens or that happens, the more you can speak to and anticipate because you truly understand the customers you're targeting, the more that you can frame your messaging around understanding their priorities, the better position you will be in for them to actually choose not only a solution like yours, but to choose specifically your solution. Yeah. And, and so number six feels to me like it's two things at once. And so the one thing it feels like is why choose you? And so that says to me, why choose you over your competitors? And in that case, in the language that I often use, it's the which one decision that buyers have to make. And then why make a decision now, which relates a lot back to when are they most likely to pay, but it's really, is there a FOMO discount? Is there something we can do to make them decide today? That's right. Yeah. And so you're specifically talking about six kind of being two, there's two parts to number six around why choose you now. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. But what I found is sometimes people do a relatively good job or, you know, some better than others around understanding their advantages, but they don't go to that next step around why now, what are you going to do to compel action? Right. So, yeah. And it's really important because yeah, I mean, ultimately I've had companies that I've worked with, that this has been a, a particular problem. They've done a relatively good job, if not a good job of communicating their advantages, but their competitors or alternatives have done a better job of why to choose them now. <laughs> so sometimes companies have actually, or, or prospects, opportunities that they, they've had in their pipeline, they've lost because they haven't created that sense of urgency. And what's key to creating a sense of urgency is creating a sense of opportunity. You create that sense of opportunity and you, you frame that well in their minds in, in terms that they understand and relate to their business and the outcomes they care about. And then that's how you're gonna create that sense of urgency. But what's key is that it needs to be directed back at your solution over other alternatives. Can you give me an example of what you're thinking of there? Around, oh, the sense of opportunity. The reason I'm curious is when I think of the word now, most of the time I think of 
the sense of urgency is if you don't act now, then something bad will happen. Like I'm going to take the deal away or it won't be available tomorrow or lead times will extend or something, right? Or we're raising prices. So I see where you're going with that. And I think that is a very good point. But what I would perhaps just want to make sure people are also thinking of is don't go down that path unless it's necessary. And so to feel like you perhaps need to have some sort of special deal or offer or time bound incentive or something like that, those have their purpose and they're an appropriate use case in which when you want to use those. But what it's unfortunate is sometimes people feel like that has to be the case. And in doing that, they actually devalue their advantages. They don't really give their value advantages an opportunity to perform. And it's more about the deal than it is about the value. (laughs) Do you see where I'm going with that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So one thing around, you know, just some thoughts around value advantages, which are just so important. And a lot of times when people reach out to somebody like me is they think they have a pricing problem. And oftentimes they actually just have a value messaging opportunity, right? So they aren't doing a very good job of not only communicating their value that will resonate with their prospects and customers, but they don't do a very good job of communicating their advantages. And you want to know why that is, Mark? Sure. Let's hear it. People actually don't spend much time understanding with clarity an honest assessment of their advantages over alternatives. Now, alternatives can be status quo, do nothing. It could be competitors. But a lot of companies don't spend much time. They make assumptions. Maybe they've identified some and they conclude that they're perpetually going to be relevant and resonate. And the market is always shifting. And the advantages that may perform for you today very well may not perform for you as well or at all in the future. And so that's kind of where I'm going with some of this. Yeah. And and I'll add into that. By the way, I agree completely. And I'll add to that is even if you understand the differences, they often don't understand how customers value those differences. Exactly. And then there's also, there's a distinction that needs to be made between an advantage and a strength. And oftentimes when I ask potential clients or clients, what are your top two advantages over, you know, alternatives? Oftentimes they struggle, number one, which it really should be, there should be clarity across the organization around what those advantages are. But aside from that, what they often bring up are strengths that really the competitors could also say as well. And one of those is truly the reality is that your people should be an advantage because nobody else has your people. But the reality is that your competitor could say the same thing, right? Unless you have some sort of individual that is perhaps well-known or recognized as has some sort of unique expertise and they are representative or part of your company. Excellent. Hey, we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to touch on the the next two, but then I want to actually talk about number nine and number 10. So the next two, seven was why keep choosing you. Number eight was why pay more from you. Love that one, by the way. Yeah, seven and eight is really around retention. And then eight is around expansion. (laughs) Yeah, but number nine, why tell others about you? What do you mean when you say that? So this is another, you know, the reality for a lot of businesses is when you go back to number five, how will they know about you is word of mouth is one of the most powerful marketing realities around business, right? And it's actually something that if you take the time, you can actually attribute to there's attribution, right? If you put yourself in the position. And so this is really about companies making sure, again, if we're trying to put you in the best position to scale to really achieve your full revenue potential in a scalable and recurring way, right? Is to make sure that you're not missing out on opportunities to get more people telling other people about the value and the difference you're making in their business. And quite frankly, in their life, so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and the number 10, why stop choosing you? This feels like the only negative one up here. It is, but it really can be used for a positive. And, you know, this was created years ago, but 
it really has come to the forefront of people's minds when you think of, for example, the COVID and how that's been handled and how it's affected businesses and so forth. So a lot of people wouldn't have thought, you know, in the past that one of the reasons people would stop choosing us or stop choosing to do as much business with us would be a pandemic, right? So again, that is one example, but what are the other reasons? And the more that you can proactively understand the realities around why your customers would stop choosing you, the more you can be in the position to, again, proactively put into place messaging, inform your roadmap around what you're prioritizing around, what you're going to launch next. All those things are just really key. Yeah, and I like what you just said in the following sense. At first glance, it feels like that's the opposite of number seven. So number seven was why keep choosing you? Well, you keep choosing me because I'm delivering value and you're growing as a company. So why stop choosing me? And it's like, well, you're not doing those. But there are other reasons. Can we identify what those are? Can we maybe mitigate what those are? Yeah. So I, I think that's a really good way to look at this. I mean, a quick example of this is one company I worked with years ago. The reason that what triggered them to reach out to me was they were starting to see after about nine months, there was a lot more pressure on their pricing, pushback and objections. And this company was sending out invoices for 700K, 1.5 million, right? That's their invoice. But believe it or not, Mark, and this is an honest to goodness, true story, the way that they were sending their invoice was an unformatted Excel spreadsheet. They were doing nothing or around reinforcing their value. And so again, 10 is really around, really highlighting the importance of reinforcing and reminding your customers of the value you're delivering because they will take it for granted. And they certainly will if you let them take it for granted. Yeah, so one of my favorite lines is everybody in your company either creates or destroys value. I agree with that. Yep, that's for sure. And, and that's quite literally everything they do. Yep. How they allocate their time and attention is either making the case and reinforcing your value or it's doing the opposite. Yep, love that, love that. Chris, this has been fabulous. Final question. What's one piece of pricing advice you'd give our listeners that you think would have a big impact on their business? Well, it's the same answer as before, but maybe with some of what we touched on before. So what I answered before was give your pricing a chance. And part of that is making sure that you're taking a really honest look at what your advantages are, an honest look at what your advantages will be in the future, and making sure that you're giving those advantages the best chance to impact and influence and just everything that goes with reinforcing your value advantages in the minds of your prospects and customers. Yeah. So don't discount too quickly, too easily. Well, I could give you another example of a, a company brand new to market retail technology. I helped them actually close their first two big customers. The next opportunity was really big. And right there, they started having all these conversations around reducing their price to win this opportunity. And we had a difference of opinion, which is sometimes the case and, and should be the case when consultants are helping their clients. They shouldn't just tell them what they want to hear. But yeah, there's always going to be pressures to reduce your price. Yep. It's up to you to stand up for your value. Yeah. Nice. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Well, I'm certainly on LinkedIn. One thing that is really easy that along what we just talked about, if they just did a Google search in quotes, most important pricing advice, they probably land at more on this and also a, a simple tool to help them think that through. Nice. Perfect. Episode 106 is all done. No real close tonight. So if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. <laughs>